This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Have I frozen again? I I get the impression <laughs> this episode is going to be as much of a mess <laughs> as <laughs> former Environment Minister, member for Griffith uh, and absolute shitposter Terry Butler's <laughs> tweets this week. Tom, Tom. Just, Tom. Put your fist down. That's racist. I'm I'm doing solidarity. No, Tom. Well, yes, but that's not what I was saying. I know that. I know that's what the fist means. But I also, but you're racist and I don't like you. Guys, you have to fist in the correct way. There are rules to Mm. fisting and it's really important. Mm. It's a safety thing Mm. and you're doing violence and... It's really important that people know the fisting rules. Fisting rules. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I just, oh, Terry. Terry, Terry, Terry. Terry Butler. Thank you, Terry Butler. It was so good. Very shitty week for the party, which we'll, yes. we'll get into. We'll get into it in a moment. But what I needed was this beautiful reminder that Australian <laughs> politics is, is absolutely cooked. The people involved are morons. And even when... The political project you're really invested in is is sort of, you know, having a tough week. <laughs> People like Terry Butler will come to the rescue with a horrific tweet to remind you how stupid they are. It's good stuff. Yeah. This tweet, for anyone not on Twitter, Terry Butler, former member for Griffith, former environment minister, uh, tweeted a photo, I guess, from a forum on flight noise. Incredible. Uh, classic. If you've ever been to a Greens event, you know at the end you get the picture and especially like, especially in the Queensland Greens, it's standard, but I think at most Greens events now, it's like you do the little fist in the air. It's the solidarity (laughs) fist, right? Everyone fucking knows that. Terry Butler tweets this. I, what did she actually say? Should we read exactly what she says? I don't want to misquote we do, her. We cannot represent, misrepresent her words. No. We have to say exactly what she said. She still has not deleted the tweet, which, you know, is extraordinary. Chef's kiss. The Greens in my community had no difficulty appropriating the Black Power salute for a protest against aircraft noise. It's not surprising that their small cohort of radical left members would feel sidelined by the Greens' white middle class base, in brackets, pictured. And then the photo involves our good friend Max Charlotte yeah. at the front doing the fist. And, and Larissa. Uh, and like a uh, bunch and of Larissa people. as well, doing the fist as well. A whole bunch of other people raising their clay. Some of them doing clay's no, image. Some of them okay. just raising both open hands but going, wee! Yeah. Because this is the thing. And I think a couple of people in the replies, because obviously the immediate reply to this is people being like, Terry, you know that's the solidarity, like that's a symbol of solidarity. Putting your yes. fist up is like a famous like symbol of the workers' movement, which as a Labor Party member you should probably know. Um, But anyway, and then like only a couple of people pointing out there are so many better directions that she could have gone because, again, if you have been at one of these photos, like if you've been in one of these photos, you know there's always like the kind of the sweet, usually like (laughs) middle aged, like maybe a little bit, you know, in their 50s and 60s, people who are, like, keen to get involved in the Greens, maybe care more about the environment, and they're like, what are we doing? And they just sort of, they'll, like, put they put their hand up open-handed. They'll do, like, a peace sign. <laughs> yeah. They do, like, both hands up and they're just like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> and that is far more worthy. Like, that is something to make fun of. Sometimes it looks like they're doing, like, a fucking Nazi salute because they're just, oh, like, putting God. their hand up. But, no, she decided to be, like, First of all, they've appropriated a black power salute, salute not yep. what it is, yep. because they're racist and appropriate, yeah, black power things. But mm-hmm. then also the the sections of the Greens movement who would, like, be affected by this are the radical minority. And so I'm also having a go at the radical minority of like black activists Mm -hmm. and the other parts of the Greens because really all Terry wanted to do was have a take (laughs) on Lydia leaving the party and on the voice stuff and she wanted to somehow get in on that. But I think Terry is like she wanted to have the cleverest take. She didn't want to have the same take as everyone else. She wanted to have like some sort of really interesting thing to say here. And so she's like, (laughs) you know what? They appropriate black 
things and this is that. There's a photo that I don't like because I'm obsessed with the fact that aircraft noise was an issue in my electorate that I completely ignored and it potentially helped Max win. And it's just, but it's a train wreck. And the best part, again, if you did not follow this on Twitter, is that she was absolutely owned in this matter of history of the labour movement by a child journalist. (laughs) (laughs) By a child. Leo Puglisi, famous child journalist. He's, what is he, 15, 16? I think he's just turned 15 recently, yes. 15, who just demolished her in the replies in a very, like, pretty earnest, just like, Terry, are you aware of this? And she just doubled down and doubled down. Tweeted a photo of her in a, a, yeah. a, a group photo which involved Kevin Rudd, perhaps the whitest man who's ever lived of all time, <laughs> and a bunch of other people raising their fists, wearing Terry Butler T-shirts, mm. raising their fists, appropriating mm. the Black Power salute Black Power in salute. a photo with them. Um, but that wasn't an issue. Uh, Terry replied, yes. Mm. Similar salutes are used in revolutionary feminist and working class movements, including the Labor movement. This photo was taken after our campaign defending universal health care. Are you seriously suggesting a campaign against aircraft noise is equivalent? So it's fu- it's okay to do it then. Okay, it's not appropriating black culture. You're allowed to do it in these particular mm, okay. examples here. Okay, but mm. when you do it with a group of ordinary people in getting together to do something, <laughs> workers' movements like the Australian Labor Party, yeah, famously <laughs> revolutionary labor movement, yeah, mm. that's no good. Um, so yes, obviously it came down in the end again. And Terry just kept replying and refused to acknowledge the fact that she'd been owned. But of course. <laughs> You're allowed. You're only allowed to do the black power salute, and it's not appropriating a black power salute if you do it in the correct mm, content. It's related it that, to certain. Yeah. But what I meant was Max shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Because it's greens. When greens do it, it's bad. But when we do it, it's it's totally fine. And then after that exchange, she then did the follow up some uh, follow up tweet to the original tweet, saying there have been lots of attempts to justify the appropriation oh, yeah. of radical symbolism for the defence of private property rights today. Oh, not to yeah. mention, and not to mention the quibbling about whether Black Power Salute can still be called that, given its use by other solidarity movements. The quibbling, you did that. Quibbling, it was you're you doing that. That's you, Terry. <laughs> Oh, my God, Terry. It's, it's such a beautiful, it's, as you say, clearly Terry had this in the chamber, okay? She's had this, she's held onto this yeah. photo. She, it's yeah. kept her warm at night. It's fed her rage. She doesn't yeah. need any heating for her home. She's just <laughs> powered by her own resentment and hatred based around this photo. And then when when the Greens have given you free reign, an absolute own goal, all right? You could have said anything about anything, this Anything, yeah. Like we're, so we, I will Greens. be honest, we're kind of falling apart at the moment. <laughs> And you somehow still manage to own yourself. <laughs> like, fuck. This is what gives me hope. Mm. No matter how bad things get for the Greens, the Australian Labor Party is still there. Still more cringe. It almost feels like an episode of The Mean Girls. We've got Lydia and Pauline sitting next to each other. Who knows? They could end up being best buds. Frankly, I've always found the Greens to be a real serious danger to Australia. <laughs> serious danger to Australia. That's right. This is a hopeful podcast. Yes. A podcast about green politics in Australia. It's serious danger. Uh. And I'm Emerald Moon and Tom Ballard is here, even though he wasn't going to be, because I forced him to come back on the show. Because to be honest, it's been a bit of a fucking week. <laughs> um... It's, look, it's very much a week where we are not an official Greens Party podcast. No. (laughs) Um, We are grateful for the support of our producer, Michael Uh, the Griff Griffin and the Green Institute, who make the show happen. Don't you dare leave us, Michael. Don't you dare walk away from this, you motherfucker. (laughs) Don't leave us, Michael. Yes. Please. We had other plans for this for this week's show. Um, initially, look, we wanted to talk about the New South Wales election. That's exciting. We're going to mm-hmm. talk about that eventually. Then all the shit happened and Lydia left and and blah, blah, blah. So we thought let's talk to someone from the Australian Greens First Nations Network, a.k.a. the Black Greens. We had an interview lined up. All I will say is half an hour before recording, that person let us know that they could no longer do the interview. So, look, it's not ideal, but... We still probably need to talk about what the fuck happened this week. (laughs) Um, Before we get into it, 
Should we thank our new patrons? We have so many beautiful new patrons and we want to welcome them to the, the family. They're getting on board this uh, sinking ship. Thank you to Ben, Michael, Morgan, Diego, Rebecca, Colin, Luke, Catherine, Alex, Clint, Solidarity Frog. Hope you're not doing any salutes, Solidarity Frog. <laughs> Ebony, Lolly, Thomas, Ilya, Mattia, Nathan, Maddie, Kathy, Left Field, Ian, Max, Patty, Deborah, Matt, and Tims. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Patreon.com forward slash Serious Danger AU for just three bucks a month. You can support the show, which is very, very nice of you. Helps us pay uh, Michael Griffin's wage and cover the basic cost of running the, the whole shebang. And you get bonus content. Like this week, we put out an episode... <laughs> A, be- a beautifully timed episode about the 18-year plan for a Greens government. This is a speech that Max Chandler Mather <laughs> gave a couple of years ago. We go through the speech, talk about it, and imagine what it might look like if the Greens are in government in 2040 and whether that's fucking bonkers or not. Look, like, feeling sad? Listen to the hopeful episode. That's true. That's true. Feel it Listen in. to yeah. this and then follow up with that if you haven't yet so that you finish on a high note. But first... <laughs> or you could also... Go to a gig. What's that in? It's this Friday. So this will come out on Sunday. And then Friday the 17th, Tom is doing some sort of laughy thing. What are you doing, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a little comedy gig in Albury for the Albury Greens, raising money for the local candidate there, Eli Devon. And, yes, if people want to come along and check it out, that would be great. It's going to be at the Albury Entertainment Centre, me telling jokes, some other local performers. It's basically a comedy night to raise some cash for their campaign for the upcoming New South Wales state election. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. If you want to come on down and have a have a little chuckle and raise some come cash for down. the Greens, then come on down. Very cute. I've told Greens Adam Bant and the Senate President that I am resigning from the Greens to sit on the Senate crossbench. This country has a strong grassroots black sovereign movement full of staunch and committed warriors. And I want to represent that movement fully in this parliament. It has become clear to me that I can't do that from within the Greens. Tom, promise you'll never resign from the Serious Danger podcast, unofficial podcast of the Australian Greens political party. Mm, I'm resigning. I'm resigning to go join the week on Wednesday. No! <laughs> no! Resigning to become an individual podcaster, one of those ones where you just talk to yourself. Where I can podcast from a sovereignty perspective. This is how I'll be working. Mm. Oh, look, we haven't, yes, we, we are going to talk through stuff. Obviously, as we, as we mentioned, we had a guest lined up. We, everyone was very kindly going to do that interview and was prepping for that and thinking about that. And, and we, as we say, we are pledged to get a First Nations, a particular Black, Black Greens perspective on both this situation and the upcoming referendum and the voice position, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we still think there's value in us talking through this with all our big fat white people settler disclaimers about this, this conversation because there is, there is the, substantive discussion around the referendum itself and the party's position on The Voice, but there's also Mm. now this political strategy question and the reality of of, of what's happened. Lydia Thorpe Mm. has left the Greens to sit on the cross bench to speak, in her words, you know, for a um, black sovereignty movement um, moving forward as an independent sector. To sit on the cross bench, can we stop saying that, though? Because, like, that's this weird thing that the media has been saying. It's like the Greens are the cross bench. I feel like it's it's that that thing right. where yeah it's this obsession with independence and they're like the independents are the crossbench now. I saw okay. someone say they were surprised they haven't started calling her a teal yet, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then they might like her more. That'd yeah, be good for Lydia. yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think the problem is the politics. Like, yeah, that's she. She would need to change almost everything she stands for to start getting a good run in the SMA. Yeah, yeah. Lydia. Okay, so. On Monday, Monday morning, we learned Lydia Thorpe was resigning from the Greens. How did you feel when you, how did, where were you when you learned this was happening, Tom? Man, I was having a beautiful day. I was walking around beautiful Perth. I'm here for the Fringe. Tickets on, oh no. Oh yeah, when this comes out, there's still one show that people can come to. But look, it's not about me. Um, <laughs> I was walking around beautiful Kings Park in Perth and then uh, just got the message in the little group chat that we had from you saying Lydia's quitting. And initially, yes, initially I was extremely worried because I thought it was like quitting politics, getting out to mm. the point where 
this furor swirling around her uh, is bad for her mental health. And she's like, fuck this shit, I'm getting out. I then learned that is not the case. And she was quitting the party. Yeah. And I felt sad. My immediate reaction was just that is really sad and disappointing for a whole bunch of reasons. I think you can feel sad and disappointed and also pretty annoyed. And, and maybe we'll get to, you know, my, my thoughts on this, 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 you know, this, this, uh, this decision by Lydia and what it means. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, gen- a general, a general vibe of being really bummed out, to be honest. How about you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it was like posted in my work Slack and I simply said, fuck. Yes. Um, <laughs> cause yeah, it, I was like, oh, that's. Show title, episode title. <laughs> fuck. Yeah. <laughs> It's awful. Like it sucks. And I think that Lydia is, as I've said many times, has been such an asset to the Greens and like Mm. quite transformative in Australian politics and, you know, probably will continue to be so. I, but I also was like, I was really pleased on this first, yeah, within the first few hours of this happening with the way that it, like the way that the party dealt with. It. So yeah. Adam uh, Adam Bent and Maureen Fruki put out a statement about Lydia leaving the party saying... Saying that she is now the same as Pauline Hanson. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what the statement said, <laughs> saying how same. mad we are and we're betrayed. No, it was like Senator Thorpe has made the decision to pursue another pathway to advance the black sovereignty movement. We're truly sorry and sad to see her leave our party room. She's made a phenomenal contribution to the Greens. They they list a number of things on which she's specifically made a bunch of progress and achievements that she's made. They say that we'll continue to work closely with her on a range of issues and that she's committed to vote with the Greens on climate. Mm -hmm. And Lydia put out her own statement, which the Greens also then like linked to and, and included in an email to members. For example, Lydia's statement, and I'll just see if we can read out maybe some of the most important lines Oh, interestingly, right, I see in Lydia's statement she she says she'll be sitting on the Senate crossbench. But anyway, this uh, this country has a, a strong grassroots black sovereign movement full of staunch and committed warriors and I want to represent that movement fully in Parliament. It has become clear to me that I can't do that from within the Greens. Now I will be able to speak freely on all issues from a sovereign perspective without being constrained by portfolios and agreed party positions. Greens MPs, members and supporters have told me they want to support the voice. This is at odds with the community of activists who are saying treaty before voice. She goes on to say she's not announcing her final position on the voice. She's going to be continue pushing for uh, saving lives as well as First Nations sovereignty. She thanks Greens members, supporters and voters for their allyship, activism and ongoing support. And she thanks Adam and Maureen who have been strong allies and she has a message for Mob. She says, your strength is my strength. Your fight is my fight. Your struggle is my struggle. So it kind of seemed like the the mood to my mind was for the vast majority of people like, wow, this is horrible. But, you know, we kind of, you could have seen it coming. It seemed like maybe this was like there was an impasse and Lydia, yeah, probably was finding it very difficult to advance her politics and her priorities and the party was struggling as much as I think they were trying to uh, accommodate that position. Like it, yeah, it was conflicting with and it was conflicting with a lot of members' views, a lot of supporters' views and potentially it it now seems other MPs' views. Mm -hmm. Do you have any intel on this little this little timeline? So, I mean, yeah, from, from, this is all from reporting. Yeah. My understanding is that the, there was a retreat organised for the Greens MPs, the party room, to go away and to work through these issues to try and sort out a position. Reports were that Lydia could not physically attend that retreat but then was mm-hmm. going to join digitally, but then there was at least some reporting afterwards that that, that did not happen either, that Lydia mm-hmm. was actually not involved in that retreat at all. Do we mm-hmm. know about any of the cold hard facts there I don't think she was in I don't think she was involved in the retreat no so I think that the expectation was and this was widely reported beforehand that one of the big things that would happen on this regular party room retreat was that they would be hashing out their position on the voice Mm. um but it sounds as though like yeah that was obviously very difficult to do without the portfolio holder yeah but then the timeline I think like I said I was feeling pretty good about how the party was handling this until 
the media release that went out on Monday night. So I think because, like, I, I know there was a bit of commentary when Lydia resigned about her being pushed out and that maybe behind the scenes, you know, Adam or other people in the Greens had encouraged her to leave or had treated her in such a way that she felt she had to leave. And I genuinely don't think that's the case. Like I think from what I have seen and know, there were like the Greens almost kind of overdo the thing of trying to reach consensus, right, and are like (laughs) bending over backwards to find a solution that we all agree with even when sometimes it's kind of impossible, right? Like is that your impression? No, I think I don't think that's the case at all. And as we discussed in our episode a couple of weeks ago about The Voice, I mean, you know, we'd gotten to the point where Lydia was having this sort of special carve out um, in a very unusual move for the Greens Parliamentary Party. She had the option to reserve her right to vote no on the um, referendum legislation, even if the rest of the party was voting a different way, which, you know, was a, an exceptional circumstance. So that was that was well- um, something that she had. Well, no, I will say that was one thing that we, like, in retrospect, it was kind of misrepresented by that article in The Age or wherever it was, where it kind of made it sound like the party room had done this special deal and allowed this carve out for Lydia, when in reality that was just a reflection of existing party rules which require Lydia to or whoever to notify party room as early as possible if there's a possible possibility that they'll be voting differently to the rest of party room. So right. it was just that... They'd had that meeting because Lydia had notified them as she should under the rules and that's all. So that was a little bit, it's not like there was some, yeah, special carve out that was given to her, but certainly I think in the, in the way that the party had like some, you know, resources and messaging support and everything to like support Lydia's negotiations and the position that was developed by the Black Greens and advanced by Lydia as the portfolio holder indicates that, yeah, there was, like, good faith engagement there. Sure. I mean, okay, it might be totally fine via the party rules, but... It's still unusual. That's true. It's unusual, and usually if a member of the Parliamentary uh, Greens Party is saying, I'm voting a different way, I assume there's a step before saying, yep, cool, no worries, that, you know, you can vote another way if you, if you so wish. There was, there was surely an attempt to try and get to a consensus position so that you can present a united yeah. front and vote together as, as a party. Yeah. You know? yeah, which I think, like, and I, I would say that's probably they still were hoping that they would get there when they yeah. had that retreat, um, but obviously that didn't happen. And look, yeah, so I was like, I think this is like good faith shit. It's awful, but, you know, whatever. What I think then played into the narrative that Lydia was pushed out and or from the fucking, you know, centrist and conservative side of of Australian politics and people who say they're progressive but for some reason really fucking hate Lydia, this idea that Lydia was like a problem that the Greens had now got rid of, Mm. I think was... Uh, that narrative was fulfilled by the fact that on Monday night the Greens put out a media release entitled Greens Party Room Backs Voice and Referendum Legislation. Mm. And this media release, like, it, yeah, it's very much just a, it leads with the we're backing the voice now, literally hours after Lydia has left. Yep. A few lines in, it does refer to negotiations with the government that led to guarantees on sovereignty and funding to progress treaty and truth. It also mm. reaffirms the party's um, position that treaty should come first and its commitment to fight for all elements of, of the Uluru Statement. But the fact that that came out then, I think it it should have been obvious that this would be interpreted as now Lydia's gone we can finally just say we support the voice and we support Mm. the referendum. And I think that was also not made any better by, I don't know if it was the next day or whenever it was, but Sarah Hansen Young's comments about Lydia resigning was like, oh, yeah, it's sad, but look, I'm just so incredibly happy because now we can get out there and campaign for yes to the voice and be on the right side of history. Mm. And what pissed me off about that is, yeah, like it plays into that narrative of like they've got rid of Lydia now And it flattens the genuine, like, critiques of the voice, the way that it's being presented right now by the government, and critiques of the government's First Nations policy in general and what other things they are or aren't doing alongside the voice into just a a Lydia problem. Mm. When, yeah, really, I, I think we always should have continued to fight for all of those things and, like, those are very valid critiques and criti- and concerns that are held by many people in the community, particularly many First Nations people. 
Uh, so I felt like that media, that was where I was like, this is a fuck up. I think a lot of people probably felt similarly, like people within the Greens. Yeah, I did not appreciate the commentary from some folks, some some of these senior Green sources uh, who are briefing the media about how terrible much of a liability Lydia was and also this this idea this insinuation that something went wrong with the process that um saw Lydia get elected as the Victorian uh Greens set that replacement for Richard Natale and then you know running for free selection again in the last election you know it's like that was a democratic decision made by members and they they made that vote so you know the the idea that there is you know something process moving forward in which no one like Lydia Thorpe could ever become a Green senator again like stuff like that is again classic conservative right wing bullshit around internal party processes which we do not like to hear. Thank you very much. Yeah, and a lot of the time, like, and that's one thing that obviously there has been some pretty disgusting and continues to be disgusting rhetoric about Lydia, which we've spoken about on the show before. That is clearly motivated by like what. It's motivated by racism. It's motivated by like people who um, are upset by anyone who upsets the status quo. And yeah, it is particularly gross when you see it coming from so-called progressives and people who effectively like to divide First Nations people into the good blacks and the bad blacks and people who make them feel comfortable versus don't make them feel comfortable. And Lydia made them feel very uncomfortable. Mm. Um, I do like I I did have this question. You know, I still have this question about whether people who are elected on a um, a party ticket and then resign from the party should be able to to keep that seat in parliament. Like it is true, Lydia now has another five years as a senator in theory mm. um, and she was elected on off the back of Greens, volunteers, resources, you know, it's a collective party, it's a movement and, and it's absolutely a, it should be a grassroots party that, is about the collective and not the individual who was elected. And so necessarily, like generally on principle, I don't agree with people who then ditch the party. I almost, and like I I know my position would be different if it weren't someone that I liked and respected as much as I do like and respect Lydia. And I would probably be like, what the fuck? They shouldn't stay there. Mm. I also think there's an argument that like, I mean, Lydia's not starting from even ground, like if if you look at, you know, if you take into account the impacts of colonization and the way that people like Lydia are shut out from politics, it's almost like on balance, I'm sort of like, yeah, probably like this process I don't agree with, but if it ends up with someone like Lydia in parliament when she probably wouldn't have got there otherwise, or she wouldn't have, then I mean, I'm not that upset about it, to be honest. Well, it's kind of like, you know, it's much of a much. There's nothing to be done about it. And the double standard applied to Lydia compared to other senators when they've done that is is bullshit, of course. And yes, if you have the principle, then you should apply that universally. And certainly a lot of voices who are very angry at Lydia, you know, might not react the same way when when other folks have, have done this and left their party. I, I But I, yeah, I'm pretty annoyed at that. I'm pretty, I think it's a pretty, the honourable thing to do in this instance would be to resign from parliament because, as you said, I mean, like I just remember in that federal election from, from, from us, the Greens in the inner west of Melbourne, you know, the chances of us winning the federal seat were next next to none. But a lot of people were out there campaigning, saying we need to get a really good Senate vote uh, for Lydia. That's That was a big rallying call for volunteers and for us dedicating ourselves to to that campaign. It felt like to me, I think you said something earlier about this feeling inevitable, and that's what I've been thinking about this week, reflecting on this. I, I feel like we were put on something of a collision course between the policy adoption of the party and where we landed on and and this particular vote. So by adopting a in what is what is in my view a pretty incoherent or inco inconsistent position to both back the Uluru Statement from the heart, then also talk about the order being, you know, running, running, adopting a policy of a certain particular order and then coming into an election year in which a Labor government will introduce their policy of introducing a referendum, which is about the voice first. Mm. I th- inevitably, you know, that wasn't a tenable position and inevitably something was messed up was, was going to happen and some kind of break was going to occur. And then I think also factoring into that, you've got Lydia Thorpe, who, as we've discussed before, is a radical politician. And the radicalness that makes her radical man or very cool, the stuff that we like about her, the way that she um, uh, presents a radical voice in our federal parliament and (laughs) doesn't respect all these bullshit institutions and does something differently that's very attractive, also felt like it was on something of a collision course 
to trying to fit into the party consensus model of parliamentary politics in the Greens. I mean, you know, the principles is what is is so embedded in Lydia Thorpe's politics. It's what, you know, it's what she, how, she, how she lives her entire life. And any kind of principle, the, the idea of her having to compromise any of those principles to go along with, as she sort of said in her statement, to, you know, be bound by agreed party positions, you know, that was, that was never going to end well, uh, I think, for, for Lydia or the party. Is that fair? Yeah, well, okay, I want to talk about this, about the actual policy because that's been one of the things that I think is still, it's still in contention whether the party room decision to back voice is now contravening the, the policy as adopted by the Greens. And there was that Greens councillor who's now like resigned and is going to be an independent who did a 23 tweet thread, um, which initially I was like, there's a lot of good stuff in that thread, I think. But the interpretation that it is categorically violating, like contradicting our policy to support the voice referendum mm. because the policy developed by the First Nations Network says we have three key priorities in this order. I think there is a difference between ordering priorities and setting a chronology, an order of events that mm. you want to happen. And I actually think like I, I also say this is why it would have been good to have someone from the First Nations Network on to talk about this, someone who developed that policy and can speak more to the intent. And I think that the statements this week indicate that it is very important to some people in the First Nations network of the Greens that treaty comes before voice. But I don't think that that is inherent in the policy. And I suspect that this has become, it has become something more than it actually is. Like this is about yeah, differences between a more radical First Nations sovereign movement and like a more centrist one. It is like about, you know, feeling as though you are getting attacked for simply critiquing or asking more for something. And and like the response to that is probably understandably to like dig your heels in and say, fuck you then. Mm. But like the fact, yeah, as I've said before, and my position on this has actually changed, as pro- people can probably tell since we last did an episode on The Voice in that I'm like, yeah, I don't really think that there is a viable, like that it is a viable option for the party not to support this referendum and not to support the voice. Uh. I think that our position should have been, and it seems close to what we've adopted now, that it's like, look, we support putting this to the people via a referendum and we're going to fight for our policy and all elements of our policy and for concrete Uh. reforms and we're negotiating with the government for those but we're not going to stand in the way of the voice. And one, like two things that really changed my mind on this. First of all, I remembered that we went to the fucking election with a commitment not to stand in the way of the voice. And I remember this because I was writing the media releases, right? Like I was working (laughs) on this and we had the direct instructions that when asked about the Uluru Statement and the voice, we would say, we will not stand in the way of the voice. We believe treaty should come first, but we will not stand in the way. And our MPs were elected on that platform and I strongly yeah. believe that it would be a betrayal to our voters to stand in the way of the voice then. And yeah. also that, yeah, like it is as part of our, you know, one of our four pillars is democracy and to stand in the way of the referendum would kind of be an affront to that. But there's also an argument from some First Nations people that not everyone in Australia should have a say on this because why the fuck do settlers keep getting to decide what happens on First Nations issues? So, yeah, like it's 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 complicated, but but I think that yeah, like trying to draw, trying to be like, well, First Nations Network designed this policy, and Party Room has now abandoned it as soon as Lydia's left, is a very unnuanced and mis misguided interpretation of what's happened here. Mm. But I mean, but there's also been frustrations in terms of again a consistency of the critique. Some some of the arguments have been based around an ordering of things and a, and a priority and a chronology. But some other critiques from Lydia and other other voices within the Black Greens have been substantive, right? I mean, like you know, Lydia was resisting the about idea the of being written into the colonizers' constitution. So there's no that's not that, not about order or anything like that. That's about like literally the very idea of enshrining a First Nations voice to Parliament in the constitution is bad for these reasons. Now, whether or not those reasons are good or whatever. But that's that's a substantive critique about the very existence of the voice itself, not when when it's happening or the order in which it's occurring. Secondly, 
the idea that treaty should become a voice. When you say that, you sort of say, well, there's not going to be, there is not going to be a treaty between now and August, October, September when the referendum a vote is, is going to happen, right? Like Labor is committed to, ha- to doing this within the next 12 months. So what you can do is say we want to push all three elements of the statement and and push for treaty, which is something that we did, right? Like we're claiming the win that in the budget we've got a Truth and Justice Commission, right? And in this in these statements about Lydia's contributions, we're talking about the things that uh, the Greens have pushed for and got some progress on. Fantastic. That's a great win. But, you, mm. you know, pointing to that as sort of an indication of the what difference the Greens have made in this debate when it comes to greater justice for First Nations people, um, taking that win, but then also seeming to imply that something more should happen in that space before having the voice referendum, to me, it doesn't make much sense. Well, I mean, I, I think we still could have fought for more. Like it's kind of, I, I don't think, it seems like we don't have a timeline for treaty. That's something that perhaps we should have pushed for. And I still strongly think that probably, to my mind, one of the main things we could have pushed for is to not enshrine the voice as simply an advisory body in the constitution, because then yes, it'll be very difficult to make it anything more. And I think that the substantive critiques of the voice Uh, A lot of them, uh, from what I can understand, are about the fact that it's just an advisory body and we spoke about this last time. I think the the critiques about putting it in the constitution, my understanding is that does relate to having a treaty first which might, you know, completely rewrite the constitution. Like I think Uh. that the expectation is that if there were a genuine significant treaty process, the constitution would no longer exist in the way that it does now. Uh. And so like... Uh, that, yeah, maybe once a treaty is made, then a voice could be put in a constitution or, you know, what it like, but it can still come after after treaty. I think what this does show as well is like, yeah, I, I think it has been shown, and I think Lydia said this recently, that a referendum, was it Lydia that said that that clearly, you know, a referendum on the on the voice is going to be harmful, has been harmful to First Nations people, whether it's yes or no. Because yes, like it, it, it clearly is, it's making people say shit that is hurting people. And like, it's making people fight so hard for something that is really not like, this is the, this is the small fry shit, you know? And that sucks. But yeah, I, I, I do still, I still do still think that we could have fought for more. And I think I, I've noticed like when I speak about the voice proposal from the government are like the proposal that the government's put forward. I'm talking about specifically, yeah, like it, that includes the timing of them pushing for the referendum. It, it includes the way that they are posing the question, the, the shape of the voice that, that would be put forward. I noticed some people on Twitter interpret this critique as like me saying, me conflating the government's proposal with the Uluru Statement from the heart. But I'm like, no, I'm talking about the way that politics works, where this that voice component, which may come from the statement from the heart, is part of a whole fucking system, like a, like a whole range of initiatives and things that the government is doing. And that's why it is incumbent on the Greens as a political movement to push for like all of the, the, the other things that could accompany that. So, yeah, I, I do wish that I wish we hadn't put out that statement right after Lydia left, because I think that that's cemented a narrative that's not actually what's happened and that's quite damaging for both Lydia and our negotiations on the voice, the voice, but I still hope that we can get more. And I do think that it's more, it is like representative of the majority of Greens members' views. I know some people like, people are like, well, we haven't properly asked all First Nations people, but it's like, it it is fairly convincing that 80% of First Nations people when polled, said that they supported the voice to parliament. Although I know mm. they were just, they weren't asked, you know, the voice as an advisory body, for example. Mm. There was something actually, Patty Gibson, the sort of uh, radical activist, did post something I saw. This is like something out of a referendum, the referendum working group. So this is the group, you know, appointed after the Uluru Statement mm. process that came out of the referendum group, yeah. which was quite critical of the idea of an advisory body, which was like in a report sort of saying a lot of people, mm. yes. even at the Uluru Dialogues, they were sort of saying, you know, it needs to have some fucking kick and some power, which does seem to have uh, fizzled out a little bit. Do you think looking back mm. that it was also an issue or, again, a, a sense of inevitable collision or conflict, contradiction, 
you know, having Lydia Thorpe as the First Nations spokesperson saying the party endorses the Uluru Statement from the Heart given Lydia's history around the Uluru process and, the you know, she was she was a member of the minority of people who walked out on that process and rejected, injected the, the conclusions or the general vibe of the Uluru Statement from the Heart process. I, I feel like that was um, an issue. Potentially. Yeah. I think it still is, yeah, it still is somewhat confused. Like I think we, it's true when we say we support all elements, like key elements of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, but certainly the party has, like the party through its First Nations portfolio holder have been very critical of the Uluru Statement like process and dialogues and it's probably not accurate to say that we support the whole thing as it is. Mm. So, yeah. And the other thing that I've been Even kicking we, around we is- we did, I think, when it came out, but yeah. Yes, we did. Well, again, I mean, Adam is certainly reiterating every statement. You know, we were the first party to endorse all elements of the statement. So I think mm. that was, again, you know, sticky stuff, something that was, <laughs> I feel like it's like a duck, you know. You know, a duck looks calm on the water and that uh, underneath the, the feet are just pedaling like crazy underneath. to try and keep, that, keep the whole thing going. I think people are seeing the duck wiggling, Tom. I yes. don't think. <laughs> the, the, the duck is, is flipped upside down. <laughs> Um, Furiously wiggling. The question of sovereignty uh, stuff, which, which I know we sort of touched on again with our um, voice question a couple of weeks ago. Again, I find it hard to follow follow the logic um, a little bit, particularly when, and people were pointing this out, I mean, Lydia did swear allegiance to the Queen, okay, and I know that she did the colonising Queen thing. She undermined that. She clearly resisted that, mm-hmm. but she did, still did go through with it. And I suppose... It was frustrating, or at least I didn't understand what kind of assurances she required in order to Mm -hmm. support this on the terms of sovereignty. We had academic experts, the Labor government themselves, um, lots of people who I think, you know, in other contexts, Lydia would listen, would would happily listen to or appreciate their perspective, giving this idea that, no, writing this voice to the Constitution does not undermine sovereignty in the same way that Lydia Thorpe is a federal senator and still asserts her rightful sovereignty as a First Nations woman, that also seemed like part of the conversation that was very hard to uh, track from my view. I don't know if you felt that way. Yeah, and I think from a lot of I think from a lot of people's view, and this is something that I had conversations with quite a few people about in the last couple of weeks, that I, I think that Lydia, I mean, in a way it'll be interesting to see what happens with Lydia pursuing a black sovereignty movement more because I would guarantee you that the vast majority of people in this country don't know what sovereign means. They don't know what sovereignty means. Mm. And that's complicated by the fact that, as I think we discussed in the in the last episode, there are absolutely different interpretations of and conceptions of sovereignty between, you know, First Nations people who would consider themselves black sovereign people um, and the kind of that Hobbesian Western idea of sovereignty and the legal idea of sovereignty. And mm. so it already is really complicated because those the, there isn't even agreement there about what sovereignty means. And then to be taking this really complicated and unsettled concept and placing that at the centre of um, our kind of our dialogue and our, our discussion of the voice, I think really confused a lot of people and yep. didn't help to advance the substance of the critiques about what power will this body have, how will this deliver concrete change and and justice for First Nations people, which is what Lydia and, and the Greens have been fighting for. And, yeah, so I think that, Yes, the the focus on sovereignty as it relates to to the voice, it's still confusing to me. And I think a lot of people, I like my interpretation of it is that, yeah, without a treaty and without genuine recognition of sovereignty, nothing else really guarantees sovereignty to to a satisfactory extent. And that's Mm. why, you know, Lydia is now, that's she's dedicating her political career to pursuing that. So in a way that makes sense. Right. Yeah, I guess the, the the word staunch is used a lot with uh, to describe Lydia, right? And I think staunch is a cool word <laughs> and a an admirable quality in people. As as we say, we love the Greens yeah, because of I'd love to be principles, staunch. right? <laughs> staunch is cool, right? And we we would love our politicians yeah. to be more staunch and to stick by their principles. That's a good thing. But I suppose you know, I was talking to my dad about this, and look, my dad's 
further to the right than you were right, that's for sure. He's not a fan. He says Lydia, no. Lydia his votes agrees, but he says Lydia, uh, Lydia strikes him as a, as not a team player is, is the way that he sort of put it. And I suppose. Team player. Well, I suppose, I guess on, on the sovereignty question, you know, raising concerns of sovereignty, there's all these answers on the sovereign, sovereignty question and then. The, then clearly not being good enough, mm. or the idea that she's part of a party room that's dedicated to, to cons- consensus decision making, and if the party room reaches a decision through extensive debate and consultation that she doesn't mm. agree with, she says, "Okay, fuck it, I'm out." Now, again, all the 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 dedication to her principles and her staunchness, which makes her very attractive as a you know left wing uh, progressive voice who fights for her people, is very admirable. But I guess I suppose. It seems to me the impression was that 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 attitude, that staunchness, is not necessarily a good fit, or where the political reality of electoral politics and parliamentary politics being what it is, they were once again on something of a collision course, and they weren't going to necessarily get along. So, so I hope I, I am expressing Maybe. that in a way that both expresses admiration for Lydia's uh, commitment to her own principles, but I guess in the context of a parliamentary um, electoral political party. Uh, yeah, stuff's gonna stuff's gonna go awry in, in in that context. Maybe I would also say I would characterize other people in the Greens as extremely staunch, and I think that like a lot of the time, yeah, it's not characterized that way for for various reasons. And I think that the again we want to say that the way that Lydia is characterised has a lot to do with her gender and her race. But you've also got Dorinda Cox in, in that same party, right? You've got Dorinda who's there and who supports The Voice, has a different level of politics yeah. and is obviously a, a comrade and ally of Lydia and they've they've um, been good friends and done mm. awesome work in that party room, but she's also a black woman who happens to have a different point of view or clearly has a different approach to this particular yeah. question. But I guess what I'm saying is, like, I don't think that it's necessarily the staunchness. I think that there are staunch people in the party who are staunchly loyal to the Greens as a political movement. And I think that Lydia, as she would absolutely say, like, her loyalty, her entire life is to the, you know, to the First Nations movement and to the Black Sovereignty movement. And so, yeah, like, that is, that's where her loyalty ultimately lies, whether that means that, yeah, maybe she should have done that from the start or or not, or she always has been open in advancing that loyalty via the avenue of the Greens, I don't know. But I think there is there are ways to be incredibly staunch and to make that work within the party. And we have other staunch MPs who maybe just aren't seen that way. Yeah, I guess so. But I I guess that, that level of dedication, to me, it seems like there is a tension between that and one's respect for democracy, right? Like, like democratic outcomes. Like, in a democ- in democracy, in democratic processes, you, sometimes you lose the argument, or you haven't brought people with you, or you find yourself in a position where you're in the minority view. And I, I suppose mm. many would argue that in those circumstances, you you prioritise or you recognise the respect for the democracy, the democratic principle, and you put that above other considerations that you that you might have. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I reckon there would probably be circumstances where, like when, I, for example, our Queensland MPs, that there might be issues that um, I would hope that they would stand up for those principles to the extent that maybe it would result in them splitting from the, mm. the party. I would hope that that would never ha- have to happen, mm. but it's possible, I think. Okay. There will be many more things to say about this in the weeks to come. As we say, we do really absolutely want to get a Black Greens member on this um, on the show to discuss this further and really get into it. I think it's important to acknowledge that also we're recording this on Friday. Um, <laughs> we're barely recording this on a Friday. Um, and there are, there are some other stories and developments. We, there is a story in The Guardian saying that the conveners of the, conveners of the Greens First Nations advisory group say they do not support the voice to parliament or referendum on Indigenous constitutional recognition, publicly rebuking their federal party room and instead backing the departed Senator Lydia Thorpe's opposition to the move. Black Greens put out a statement and Dr Gennaro Grangering, the national co-convenor of the Greens First Nations Network, that's the Black Greens, um, is basically laying it out in, in pretty clear terms. In that statement she said she thinks that, that you know, Racism, institutional racism, played a big role in what's happened to Lydia, and they they feel pretty aggrieved by what's happened this week. Certainly, but what's happened to Lydia, and also in their view, the party's position on the Voice. 
And, you know, there's some pretty pretty stark quotes here. This is her talking to The Guardian, um, Gennaro, Gennaro, previous serious energy guest. She said, we don't agree to a voice in the Constitution. We won't move from that position. It has no power. Other Greens MPs have claimed the First Nations Network has told a party meeting last week that they shouldn't oppose the voice to Parliament, backing a version of events. Adam Bant wrote to members in an email on Tuesday, as you said. Uh, the party sort of sent out a release saying that we backed the voice. So once again, again, and I'm sure there's internal stuff going on here. I don't want to put people's words in people's mouths, and I hope that we can have a Black Greens member to have a chat to us to sort of lay this out. But again, we are in a position in which it is unclear um, as to what the party's position is, what the official party position is, what the Black Greens position is when it comes to the voice to Parliament. This is going a lot further than quotes that Gennaro was giving a couple of weeks ago, again, in our voice episode, in which the impression I got was that Black Greens backed the idea of a voice, but the way it had critiques about the way in which it was it was done. This seems to be a, a hardening of that position to the point where a voice in the constitution is not an ideal outcome. Yeah, and I think I think there are lots of possibilities here. I think that it's possible that the, you know, in the space of a verbal interview with a journalist something came out that could be interpreted mm. in a way that's different to what the official position was. I think that the, you know, the party's position now has been pretty clearly expressed by that media release that went out from from party room. They're going to support the mm. voice and they're going to support the the referendum. But yes, like clearly there's and and I think a lot of people who are very involved in the party would be feeling pretty shitty about how this is all happening. There was, you know, there was a national council meeting and there were like people confused about why they couldn't attend even though it's in no way normal for people to attend a national council meeting. Right. There's people, yeah, concerned about this discrepancy between what the you know, First Nations Network have said in this Guardian article, I noticed that the Guardian article is then updated the next day. Like, so that article came out Wednesday night. On Thursday, it was updated to say that meeting notes did show that the First Nations Network told Adam Bant's office that they should support the voice, um, you know, that they basically had to support the voice, which is what initially came out of that release on Monday night. Oh, Lydia, oh, Lydia, that encyclopedia. Oh, Lydia, the champ of the war. She once swept an admiral clear off his feet. The ships on her hips made his heart skip a beat. And now the old boy's in command of the fleet. For he went and married Lydia. I said Lydia. He said Lydia. They said Lydia. We said, said Lydia. La, la. And of course there's other shit that's fucking still happening in and out of Parliament, very big things. You know, there, like this week, for example, we had the first time that a federal environmental minister has rejected a coal mine under federal enviro laws. Um, Clive Palmer's Central Queensland coal mine, it's not the big one, as I uh, initially I was like, wait, Waratah coal, that massive one that we've spoken about before, it's not that one, it's Central Queensland, but it's interesting that a Labor government would be willing to reject a coal mine. We still need a climate trigger in our environmental laws because other coal mines can go ahead, but that's a big mm-hmm. thing. And, you know, the, I think the, the Greens did a bit of like muscle flexing this week, potentially important given that we've now lost a senator and there are questions about whether we still hold that powerful voting block in the Senate. But after the government had apparently backed down on a deal around big fines for dodgy bankers as part of this financial accountability regime legislation, the Greens said, well, you backed down on that, so fuck you, we're going to vote to um, disallow these new rules that would have made super fund reporting less transparent. Mm. And they were able to defeat that. And so that's the first time that I think that we've actually helped defeat government legislation in the House, this new this new Labor government. And so it, um, I'm sure there'll be more of that to come. There's a bunch of shit that's going to be happening. Fucking Alan Tudge resigned. You're a cunt. Fuck that guy. Absolute criminal. Shout outs. Uh, Shout outs to real one. Arch- one of the architects of RoboDebt. Uh, so there's going to be a by-election there. They were saying it might be Josh Frydenberg, unlikely. Who knows? The yeah. Greens are like it's been kind of bizarre and I've, you know, I've seen our MPs in there like doing their other jobs while uh, it, amidst what would have been, I'm sure, an incredibly emotionally exhausting week. But there's hope. We still have a shitload of new MPs mm. and we're going to save the world. We're going to save the world. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's important. Uh, Gabrielle de Vietri did her first speech to Parliament in Victoria this week. You know, good stuff is happening. I mean, I think yeah. it, it's important to underline this. And this is not just this is not just cope. Okay, this is not just us desperately hanging on to to good news. Because I, I, you know, a feeling of demoralisation could be very clear. We've talked before about how a lot of these media beat ups are specifically designed to demoralise people and to. Mm question their faith in, their, not faith, their belief that the Greens can exist as a party, can do things differently outside the major party system. That is that is a deliberate strategy. And, you know, it might feel this week like all the optimism and energy around the 2022 election, the green slide, some might say, um, has, has, mm-hmm. has fallen over because of this week. And I just I want people to remember that's not true. And I really want to underline the fact mm-hmm. that all these, that once again, the double standard applied to the Greens the chaos, the, you know, it was not a yeah. good week for the Greens. It was bad. But as yeah. if the chaos doesn't exist yeah. in other parties, you know, m- most notably the Labor Party when they're in goddamn government, <laughs> knifing each other in the back like crazy. And, you know, not to shout out my own tweeting game, but when Pauline Hanson was hanging shit on the Greens <laughs> for being chaotic, I published four headlines. Oh, my God, uh, of all in, people. Uh, involving, yes, involving One Nation's people quitting the party, one of which being fired because they um, mowed a Nazi salute into his front lawn. Okay, so we're we're better than them. Yeah. Uh, that's that's important Jesus to do. Um, and it is, it's got to be bigger than... Than individual MPs. So again, another attractive element yeah. of the Greens is that we don't venerate or worship or invest everything in the ideas of our individual MPs. They are still party members mm-hmm. and the movement is bigger and better and broader and more important than that. We wish Lydia thought well. Um, it, it's, it's, it's great to know that, you know, I think she's clearly open. It's, it's not an acrimonious relationship. There is still going to be uh, the possibility to yeah. work together in the future, particularly on climate matters. I think that's fantastic. I think her platforming ideas around black sovereignty and speaking freely about First Nations justice on stuff is great. I mean, still, even in the chaos of this week, Lydia is underlining how the government could just do the recommendations outlined in the Royal Commission on Black Deaths in Custody. Like just once again, pointing out how little Australian governments are doing for First Nations people when they easily could do those and are trying to get all the credit out of the voice. Mm. I think that's very worthwhile and fantastic. But yes, I guess just I just want to say you know take heart, everybody. Fuck you, shitty week, but um, it's but there's still okay. so many more things. It's gonna be, it's all gonna be okay. And I guess I say I guess I just raise my fist in solidarity and I say, hang in there, okay. <laughs> hang in there. <laughs> Hopeful is always, you know, swing some votes, get out there and swing some votes. If you're in New South Wales in particular and you can get along to a door knock, um, head along to the, like, check out your your local branch events or your local campaign events or you can look on the Greens events website. One in particular that I saw is there is like a phone bank event that you can join from anywhere in the country as well. So you can oh, cool. register, they'll send you a Zoom link, everyone jumps on and you can make calls from wherever you are. It's really important, especially, yeah, if you can't get on the doors and yeah, they're they're trying to win a bunch of seats in New South Wales. We're really keen to do a New South Wales election special episode, but yeah. we'll put the link in to register for that phone bank event. You should get along to that if you can. And again, we'll get to this. But like speaking of the Greens' commitment to First Nations justice, I mean, New South Wales Greens policy is to look at you know pushing a treaty, resulting in something like dedicated seats in Parliament for First Nations people, right? Like mm, like that is yeah. a pretty awesome policy that is is seriously changing. The level of power that that, that uh, First Nations people will have in a, in a tangible way, not an advisory capacity, but actually dedicated seats like they do in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, really keen to talk about that further and and flesh out that policy in in, in coming weeks. <sighs> Love and solidarity to you all. Don't forget, please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or if you're listening now, if you want to make us feel better because this has been a real shit show of an episode (laughs) Um, and I would just love to see a little five-star review. It would just make my little day. And it also makes my day when you follow us, share our stuff, comment, etc. on social media. We're at SeriousDangerAU on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok and YouTube. And 
what would just put the biggest smile on my face of all is if you signed up on Patreon, if you haven't already. It would make Mike smile very big. He's had to deal with a lot this week <laughs> and he deserves to get paid. Uh, even if it's just the three bucks a month from you, my loves, uh, head to seriousdangerpod.com. All the info is there. Love you. Solidarity forever. Oh, God damn. Serious danger, Australia.